Oh, people. People. Oh. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the city. <laughs> Welcome to this afternoon session, uh, where we begin with a, the second master class held by our friend Stefano Iacus, that recently uh, moved to the United States. But he and his master class is about the limited challenges of incorporating innovative data sources, maybe, in official statistics. And uh, as far as I understood, you will be more oriented towards your European, European experiences rather than on the United States experiences. So thank you, the floor is yours. And uh, the proposal is to act as for the former uh, masterclass, one hour of uh, masterclass held by Stefano and then we will begin with the questions and uh, I, I trust that the, 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 the spirit will be vibrant and so on. Well, thank you. The floor is yours, Stefano. So thank, thank you very much, <clears throat> Daniela, and thank you uh, Mauro and all the other members of the, of the organizing committee for inviting me um, to give this yeah, <laughs> to, 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 to talk about, um, I mean, although the, the, inter the session is called Masterclass, I'm actually, I've been invited to tell you about my experience uh, in trying to put together official statistics, let's say, or traditional data uh, and uh, so-called innovative data or alternative data sources. I decided to change slightly the title um, because essentially every time there is a challenge there is also an opportunity or maybe more than one opportunities and this is part of the experience we um, we did um, when I was the European Commission so just for fun I generate this image with ChatGPT. there should be at least one AI thing in any talk today um, and it's nice because even in this kind of simple thing, you can see hallucinations going on. So it's not just, I ask about, give me some image about official statistics, non-traditional statistics and human-centered infographics. And then we see octopus generated artificially <laughs> and very strange, maybe some even code of someone in the ChatGPT database. Anyway, so this is just to introduce the fact that, of course, when you use all this data, uh, there is the privacy concern, there is also the, uh, the quality and the accuracy, and this is just a fun thing. So first of all, let me, because I, I will actually talk about, um, say, non-standard non things, um, which everyone is doing now, um, but it's important to recognize the, the crucial role of, of official statistics or say even traditional data, I mean survey data and things related to that. Because it's very important when you analyze different types of data and we, we already saw something today um, to take into account why official statistics are so important. So let me recognize the main things. First of all, uh, official statistics is meant at least for the place where I was working on um, to, to actually drive um, or inform policies. So this policy should be based on real data, where, where real means quality data given some framework, some design and so forth. Of course, they are used also for public accountability and transparency, which is something we always miss in uh, so-called private data. And of course, there is economic planning, development, um, public awareness, uh, of course, and engagement of a citizen into the real life of the country. But I, I highlight a few things that I will touch upon in my, say, series of experiences. One is to try to measure or 
understand social progress and help research because I, as you will see most of my application rely on the fact that there is somewhere an official statistics which can be used as an anchor to validate what we are doing with non-official statistics. This is another important point. And then of course they are meant for international comparison which may lead or not to cooperation, that's another point, and crisis man management and response. So the last two points are very um, important because f most of the examples I will deal with are about migration. And so these two components are very uh, interconnected. Of course, when, when we talk about migration data, so I will, f I will focus on migration statistics, but this applies to any, any field, of course, of um, society. Um, even the definition of what a migrant is, is very important to understand what we are studying. And even if you use the so-called traditional uh, data sources, we have uh, limitations also there. We have seen, even today, so when we try to use, uh, to build registers, population registers, it's very hard. It's, there, is, there are lots of assumptions you have to make in order to, to come up to, with some definition that then you are going to use from that point on. And of course, this applies to uh, the work done here at ISTA and any statistical office, national statistical office. So in this category, follow the population surveys, as a census, sorry, uh, the surveys, population registers, different types of administrative data and also operational data. So these are part of the uh, data that have been generated kind of officially, um, say, and not by, um, say, third party. And we know, of course, collecting good surveys or collecting the census data, it's a high cost, low frequency, uh, although it is increasing now with the continuous census um, framework. And sometimes you might have sparse coverage, despite the fact that these are, um, say, weighted statistics um, and, and all the rest. In some cases, thinking about migration especially, there are some very important components like, for example, the gender or the education, um, which are missing in the official statistics. So maybe you know the citizenship, but you, you are missing other type of information which are crucial to, uh, to policy. Um, makers. So, for example, if you look at this um, four set of data, um, evaluating or try to, how to say, assess uh, the stock of migrants by country of birth in Spain. So we have Eurostat, OECD data, United Nations UNDESA, and World Bank data. You see that even the official statistics, um, they may have um, different numbers. Sometimes close, sometimes not. Of course, it depends on the reference uh, on which these uh, data have been collected, so the date, um, the granularity, and so forth. And sometimes you see, like the World Bank data, they are not continuous. They just did for some reason uh, because they have the money for doing these surveys and, and so forth. So even in official statistics, things are, are complicated and we need to understand exactly what the data means in order to, to then uh, go to the next step, which is the analysis and the, the usage of the statistics. And for example, these are the comparison within Eurostat and the OECD, which have the larger coverage, let's say, in time and space. And you see there is a discrepancy, which one can say, okay, this is a structural discrepancy, so it's a kind of uh, fixed bias that, that we can adjust when we go from one to another. But in fact, this is not. This bias is not even constant. So it's very hard to, to work with this data. You have to choose something and, and it, anyway. It, it is not a critics, it's just a fact. This is just how it is. And of course, these kind of problems are amplified when you don't control the data source uh, process. So what I'm, what I'm going to, to review now is a series of examples and, and say a summary of what we learned by analyzing the ex an extensive literature up to say last year, December last year, no, sorry, 2000, yeah, last year, 2022, at the European Commission. I was working for the unit called Migration and Demography. Um, and we try to map um, all the 
possible data innovation strategies and, and experiences around the world, even across uh, uh, National Statistics Institute, um, on the topics related to demography and particular migration and human mobility. So we try to map the applications and the data sources. So you can have different types of say, data sources uh, with which you can do any other type of statistics, not just migration things. But conflict data, satellite images, uh, web search data, and then a series of data for good uh, data set which have been released by META during the, the COVID pandemic. Then mobile phone data, CDR and XDR are two types of mobile data. Our passenger data, uh, Twitter or X data, Facebook advertising platform, Instagram, and then you name it, all, all of them. And then how they map to different types of uh, studies and application across the literature. And you can see that you can use multiple non-traditional data sources, like, you, for example, if you want to, to estimate population maps or population density maps, uh, you can use, of course, satellite data image, you can use CDR, you can mix them together and, and try to extrapolate population density map in those territories where census data are not available. Uh, think about Central Africa or um, re some remote regions and so forth. You can even study, and I will give an example, uh, remittances. So remittances is one of the hardest <laughs> statistics to estimate, uh, but it's a lot of money flowing around the world, and it has a political implication and, and of course, interest. Um, okay, anyway, I start with the summary. So after, there are three slides on the, on the summary. After that, you can sleep because it's after lunch session. I will wake up you at the end of the first hour, but anyway, so essentially, what, what I can summarize is that there are, um, uh, this type of data has been used, say the non-traditional statistics, essentially to fill the gaps where traditional statistics for some reason um, cannot catch uh, that type of reality, which might mean, uh, say, um, gaps in, uh, in temporal or space uh, dimension. This is the most frequent examples. Uh, sometimes you have uh, country level statistics, you want to go regional level. And then, of course, you mix all this data and try to in interpolate or extrapolate with some machine learning or statistical methodology um, uh, this kind of information. And, and overall, um, sometimes they, they are also used to, it's, it seems strange, but also to validate survey data. Because sometimes when you ask, of course, someone to people about what how happy you, you were like six months ago? You don't know. And, and, and even if you answer, it's not the answer corresponding to the truth, the ground truth, because in these six months, something happened in your life. So there are many, this is a simple example, but there are many situations in which there are, um, say, errors. I call it measurement error, but it's not, you, you don't have to take this so strictly. Uh, in the sense that there might be um, errors, even in survey data, which are supposed to be good by definition. Um, and so it seems that the competitive advantage of this integration of different types of data is that, of course, you can increase, um, you can have greater geographical and temporal granularity. You can have uh, near real-time availability. So once you uh, kind of validate this data on traditional or official statistics, you can use this data in real time in the waiting of the next official statistics to be confirmed and, and published. And you have extensive coverage because you have seen even international statistical institutes, organizations, sorry, like uh, the World Bank, they don't cover all countries. They cover the countries for, that for some reason they're interested in because of their development programs. Um, then, of course, um, different types of methodologies have been used. Uh, it's usually a mix of methodologies, not just one, based on the type of data, of course, the type of, um, say, traditional data that you're trying to integrate and the type of uh, data source, you know, innovative data source that you deal with. Um, <clears throat> and even uh, we saw um, innovative use of, of traditional data when they are combined to non-traditional data sources. So data which are collected even for, say, official statistics reason for some specific um, task, they can be used in other 
uh, say, fields just by combining them with other data. So kind of reviving even uh, traditional data. And one of these is, uh, um, of course, the census data uh, that you can use, uh, putting together them with mobile phone and satellite imagery data to create high density maps, which are otherwise uh, impossible to get with traditional microcensus data. Anyway, so far so good? No, of course. Um, there are still lots of problems uh, there. So the data linkage is a big problem, um, in particular, under which condition these data have been released, uh, what is the, I mean, all the privacy concern, my first slide, and then the data protection. So when you, when you get this data, for example, from a mobile phone operator, where do you store this data, how you protect this data, and so forth. It's, it's not just about the statistical issues around this data. There are many ethical and say, illegal issues. <clears throat> and then data sources may disappear over time. So for example, um, everyone uses Google Mobility report data. And at some point, Google say, OK, now the pandemic's over. Switch off. And you're done. Despite the fact that we don't know even how these data are collected, you have also to reverse engineer this data, try to validate them. So it's a lot of work. But any, in any case, they can just disappear, just because they don't have economic interest in doing this. And of course, there are several types of bias. We are all statisticians here are not going to detail too much this. Um, but this is just maybe a repetition of, of the first slides. They can be used essentially in the same um, ways you, stati um, traditional statistics are used. So situational awareness, uh, now casting, yeah, you know what it means, crisis response, prediction and forecasting when put together. And there are still fields to be explored, like impact assessment, evaluation, and experimentation, which can be done through this data. So you can run experiment and see kind of in real time the response in some cases. Something you cannot do, I mean, you can do with statistical, official statistics, but it takes years to get the results. So three things that have to be, to my uh, understanding, uh, be fixed. So say three areas or three types of condition, the legal condition, the technological condition, and the scientific conditions. Uh, all of them are important. So the legal condition I already mentioned. So there must be a legislation which allow the, um, for example, the national statistical offices to access this data. There is the EU Data Act, which has been uh, published. It's recorded, so I cannot really tell everything, but the first, I can tell you that the first version of this uh, pact was much different than what it is now. Now it's completely watered because of the many stakeholders. So essentially, this access is not guaranteed, even through this act. And this is a real issue. So until there are the conditions for doing this, the National Statistical Office, even if they want to do this, they can't do this, because they don't have the legal basis to produce this kind of statistics. Then, of course, um, and of course, you have to respect fundamental rights and also the interests of the private sector. And you will see an application uh, by using Facebook data. So Facebook, for example, do not disclose the number of users they have in each country because this is a commercially sensitive information. Then Twitter can use it to advertise a particular subpopulation by looking at Facebook data, and things like that. So there are, of course, economic interests around this data and human rights. Then the technological aspects. Um, so there is a need of technological investment because we are talking about big data. So, and this big data comes, of course, with the 4V, so velocity, whatever, volume. We need to be able to analyze this in real time. There is the ethics of data handling and, and preserving privacy. So data leakage is a, is a real problem, we know. Um, an investment, I think, should be um, consider we are in Europe, so maybe at European level at least, to foster collaboration between data owners and the, and the statistical institutes. Essentially, some money should be put there to make this data available. We cannot just expect data for good things because they just don't work. And there should be, say, an equally uh, weighted partnership between private and public uh, research. Also because the same people, the same researchers work at both institutions. So 
they have equally rights to, to say what they think about what this collaboration should be. And then the, the scientific part. I remember when I first participated to the Big Data Commission here at ISTAT, like more than 10 years ago, I was considered kind of erratic because we were start using big data and the statistical community was not ready yet to, because of the many problems of this data that we all know, to accept that even an application could be pursued with this data. Um, and now the situation is not so changed um, because of some of the reasons I already mentioned and because um, part of this um, knowledge is in the hands of computer scientists. So this is kind of a shout to statisticians. So please bring back the data to where they should be belong. So to statisticians, to statistics. <clears throat> and this applies to AI too. So AI are just machine learning models which are just statistical models. So why shouldn't we be part of this uh, table, let's say. So we need to empower also the institutions with professional figures, not just statisticians who were working in university, in academia, they come to, I don't know, ISTAT, and they have to deal with other types of, say, <laughs> they have to focus on different things. Actually, we need to, to prepare professional figures to be part of the uh, production of official statistics too. Um, and of course, this applies also to not just official uh, statistics institutes, but at other type of institutions. So otherwise, all that we found in the literature um, keep remaining just an academic divertisement, so we will never turn into real statistics, essentially. Lots of paper published, very little uh, statistics. So anyway, some examples uh, that work. Um, I want to, yeah, to just tell when we were able to, to make something meaningful out of these statistics. So first of all, for those who never um, knew the Facebook advertising platform data, this is the platform that you use if you want to advertise a product on, on Facebook. And essentially this platform gives you the, an estimate, um, sorry, this is not, a in, not in the statistical terms, but a number, let's say, um, of, of a target population in terms of uh, the age, the gender, the education, the region, and also the personal interest of the people because you want to sell products. So this is aimed at selling products. Um, you can get this number. You can scrape through some kind of API this data, although Facebook say you don't have to use this data. So it's up to you. <laughs> I'm not suggesting this. Uh, but anyway, this, this data are not available over time. Um, no. So, sorry, retrospectively. So you start collecting the data and you, you need to keep collecting the data. And just to show you with which type of information you get from this data, of course it depends on country to country. But for example, in this toy example, I, I just asked for the distribution by age and gender of Uganda population. I don't remember when, 2019 maybe. Um, there were 2.3 million people on Facebook, registered on Facebook. Um, of course, the population of Uganda is, is much more than 2.3 million. So it's just a percentage of the population. And then if you look at distribution by age and gender, it's quite biased. The nice thing is that we do have official statistics, so we can control the bias. So we can, we can construct a system of weights like we do for um, the electoral polls, uh, so that we can somehow um, take into account this, uh, this bias and try to produce uh, meaningful statistics. And this is what has been done in this study. During the Venezuelan crisis, um, maybe you don't remember, but uh, people from Venezuela do not need a visa to access Spain. So they can just flew to Spain and stay there. And there was a big crisis, uh, those people f flying in there. And of course, the EU was interested in understanding these numbers to offer support for the, for the migrants. And so, yeah, if you look at this data point here, this is the, the overposition of three types of statistics. So the Eurostat statistics, the national statistics of Spain, 
which is slightly different in both our official statistics. And then this is the Facebook estimate a few, uh, say, a few months later. Then if you look at the progression in time, of course, in time, you don't have anything but either survey, if you're able to collect the survey in a crisis period, or in this case, Facebook data. So after taking into account all these distortions that you have seen, we could have been able to, to essentially draw a path about where it is, is going. And if you see the last point where we have the first official statistics from the National Institute of Pain, these two number coincides almost at like few thousand people difference. So this is just an application. You might get, you might say, okay, you have been lucky because these two number coincide just by chance. But in fact, we replicate this in many other situations and they seems to be mm, working, let's say, to some extent. And Eurostat statistics will have come a few um, months later. Another application is maybe if you want to use this data to, to understand the, the behavior of migrants because you are interested, for example, in integration. And so this is a, a combination of two types of data. is the, the traveling survey of UK, which is the only country who actually uh, at the airport asks you from your nationality, not just where you come and where you go, but also which is your nationality. So you can map the nationality. All other international statistics do not map this information. I mean, travel statistics do not map the country of residence of these people. So essentially, just to say long, long story short, uh, what we see is that the behavior of these people uh, look through the Facebook platform, um, kind of bring with them their culture. And what we see is that those people uh, coming from low-income country, and especially women, when migrate to UK, they keep the same behavior. So the same gender inequality, is observed, which is observed at origin, is kind of transferred to, uh, to the country destination, which means there is a difficulty in the path of integration because, of course, UK or European people do not behave uh, in this way. Another type of data which is, uh, which is available, um, this is a public index, uh, it's called the Social Connectedness Index, is about uh, the connection, the relative number of connections between the Facebook users across countries. Facebook does not release the, the, the terms of this, uh, of this equation, so these three numbers are not available, you only get the SCI index. So we have to reverse engineers. And so what we did, we used the Facebook advertising platform to actually reverse the equation and get actually the actual number of connection between country I and country and country J. Because we wanted to use this as a proxy for attraction of migration or in another application to, to study remittances. Is there any connection between the money you send back to your country and how how strong you are connected to the country of origin through what we see on Facebook. So the network effect. And so this is a model that we, where we use, um, say, official statistics. There are different types of uh, personal remittances, um, these four variables there, which you can find on the, um, on the World Bank and IMF data. So essentially what we, we try to see is whether we can improve the, say, the prediction of the remittance flow by in introducing these uh, Facebook-derived statistics. And what we see is that, of course, I'm not going into detail, but essentially the most, these are standardized coefficients. So the most important variance, of, of course, is the, the stock of migrants. So we know migration follows the stocks of, of migrants. So this is the most important variable. But the second imp most important variable, more than the GDP difference between country of destination and country of origins, or the distance between the country, the fact that they share common borders and so forth, um, is due to the Facebook connectivity index. And of course, you can use this at any granularity and try to, um, to do some kind of extrapolation. Uh, let me skip all of this. Uh, maybe also, I also mentioned this one. Uh, this was about the, um, the first Syrian crisis in 2016. So we collect all the Instagram posts uh, for one week of data from the eDomain account. Because of geolocalization, you can get all the image published there. 
And then we went to their, each of these individual profiles to see how many of these photos were actually uh, taken by refugees or suspect of being refugee, because the definition of refugee is also a statistical concept. Of course, there were many f photographers, there are many, say, um, uh, NGO people there, but part of them were really refugee because it, it was the first crisis in which it was evident that those people were highly skilled, um, they, they had higher, higher, higher connectivity, so there was a suspect that probably all these images may not come just from journalists but also from real people. And then we, we follow these people in time, so we went to, to check their profiles, we asked for permission of accessing their profiles, and this opens a wide, say, vulnerability issue in terms of privacy protection uh, and so forth, human rights. But anyway, we did this with, under some agreement. And, and we find very strong correlation between the people that we found in these Indomani camps and the number of, um, of, of people which have, which have later, the year later, migrated uh, to some country around Europe. So like 0 0.75 correlation, whatever it means, it's just a signal that there is something in this data which is useful. Unfortunately, Instagram closed the API just a couple of months later. So once again, this data source just went away without any, any notice. And there is nothing you can do uh, to change the thing unless there is a legal framework for, for doing this. Um, there are other examples, so I think the slides will be put online, so I, I want to go a bit faster here um, about how you can use, uh, for example, you can mix uh, natural language processing, um, Twitter data, and high-density um, population statistics to, to measure things like the power integration of a city or to, uh, to measure diversity. Um, of communities on the territory. Of course, where you have official statistics to anchor the data. Okay, uh, let me skip echo chambers. Another type of data is uh, travel data, which have been used a lot uh, in our, um, uh, say, unit. Um, so with travel data, you, you might see some, something that official statistics takes time to capture again. So, for example, um, there are two points on this, on this plot, two vertical lines. One is, is when the, um, this is the, sorry, this is the number of flights between uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Herzegovina and, uh, and Germany. Of course, after the visa liberalization, the number of people migrating every year is steadily increasing for, uh, these are mostly workers, so for economic reasons. But then, uh, suddenly, something new happens. There is a big jump uh, at the end of 2014. And why is that? The visa, I mean, the regulation is not change, has not changed. What happened? Well, one of the, of the air, fly, air, fly, air, air flight companies decided to open a new connection. And this just facilitates migration. Meaning that um, now I'm talking to those people working on migration modeling, even migration it's not a given thing, it's so complex, it depends on many things, and this type of data can help you uh, to catch what is changing in your model. So in this case, the facilitation of the connection changes completely, completely the, um, the structure of the data generating process, if you want to call it this way. And of course, this is the integration with mobile phone data and, um, and population density registry. Uh, this is the city of Milan. The, dark, the red dark spot that you see is the density of, say, people using mobile phone calling China. And in fact, this is Chinatown in, in Milan. And you can see this, of course, um, <clears throat> many times. Milan has a very good registry of uh, population, so it's very highly detailed. We have nationality and many other things, country of origin. And so you can do this type of analysis. The nice thing is that you can see, for example, growing community in places where you probably didn't expect, like this, uh, this yellow spot here, which is not Chinatown. It's just maybe a region where these people are accumulating. And of course, you will see this after some time. Now I want to go to, uh, in detail about one of the techniques uh, that this is a work of mine. Uh, 
Um, but it's, a, it's just to show how you can integrate different types of data and the, the problems that you have in, in, in doing this kind of integration, besides the, the bias, uh, which is always there, of course. So the, this was um, a project from what is now called the EU AA. It was called EASO, which is the European Agency for Asylum Support. So their mandate is to, to assist people in collecting all the application for asylum support across Europe. So their need was, I need to know in four weeks how many people will arrive in each, uh, say, say, port, so entry point in Europe, because I need to logistically send people there to process these, uh, these applications. So that's the reason why they ask for this collaboration. So we put together many things. They have operational data, so they collect data in real time about the applications, very high frequency data. These are not official statistics. Um, so Eurostat does not recognize this data um, because they are unofficial. There are lots of errors in, in this data, of course, because they are collected real time. There might be duplicates, they are not confirmed and so forth. Even the nationality of people coming, uh, when they do apply, they, they write a nationality, but then someone will check about this nationality. So the official statistics later will check about the correctness of this information. And this is something operational data don't have. So we put together different types of data. So this operational data, um, the official statistics about the um, illegal border crossing from Frontex, which is the say, European policy, police, sorry. Um, then we have the, the Google Trends data. We try to capture the intention of migration. So people who search for visas or for social condition in a, or working condition in a given destination country and also event data. So data which are collected, data about um, whether there is um, a war, an economic problem, or something like that. All of these data amounts like to, for each couple of origin destination, there were 400 variables at least on average, um, all with different resolutions and of course quality. Some were daily data, some were weekly, monthly, and even monthly data, like for example, the Frontex data, because they are official statistics, they were three months lagged. So all of these things should be taken into account at the same time. And so this complex system provides essentially after normalization and some kind of um, quality control, let's say, um, provides both an early warning system, so something is going wrong in one of the time series, let's see what it is. So let's call the, um, the, the port or let's call the authority and see whether this is really a signal or, or not. It's really an operational thing, this one. And then a forecasting, because the need was four week ahead forecasting. Again, there is this database, which is called GDL. There are many of them. Another one is ACLED, where they measure, they took all the, the press, mostly Western press, and they, they transformed this press release or press article into event. So the, you have geographical coordinates, you have the actors who is doing what. So someone has shoot someone else, or they have attacked something, or there is, a, I don't know, a protest in Rome, whatever. And so there are five, six uh, type of, uh, um, say, domains like conflict, economic, social unrest, the governance related problem, political events, and also um, um, climate, say, events, which, are, which is not part of this analysis. Anyway, from which you can construct indicators. And then we have the Google search data, different type of, say, topic, um, operational data, and all of this is put together after some normalization, control, so interpolation and extrapolation depending on the frequency we were using, um, matching in space, not just in time, because, uh, for example, legal border crossing data from Frontex are made by root, so you have to match the routes with the, with the origin destination country, which is not unique. Um, then citizenship for recognition rates, all these type of things. So what I mean is that when you put together all this data, you have, if, 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 if using traditional data, you have just one problem. So checking the definition of the two <laughs> statistical institutes, here you have much more problems. So you need to be very careful of what you do and you have to validate this data continuously because things can get very, very badly. 
Anyway, you can have missing data. For example, sometimes Google Trends will, will not release the data for some reason because, because they have confidentiality threshold. They decide not to give you the data if it's below some threshold, but this threshold is unknown, things like that. So you have, you have to create a robust system to, to deal with this data. Um, anyway, and then you have another problem. This is a time series problem, but these data are not stationary by any definition of stationarity. All models out there work for stationary process. Like all statistics is, is designed for IAD data, this is not the case. So when you deal with this data, you have to think deeply of how to analyze this data. So we went for a dynamic model. Uh, so let me skip all this stuff. Like the standard um, elastic net model. So it's essentially an OLS for the first part here. So it's kind of regression model plus um, two penalty functions, the L1 and L2, so the ridge estimator and the elastic estimator. And you try to, in order to, to be less um, prone to overfitting, let's say, and to take into account that many of these variables are correlated, we went for, a, for an elastic net approach. But we did this on, an, uh, on a moving window because we cannot use past uh, data from the very past, we need to use um, data from the close past. Otherwise, we under or overestimate uh, our dimensions. And you apply this to all these 400 dimensions, you do model selection and so forth. So um, there, will, there will be a machine learning session, I think tomorrow. So this, will be, this kind of model will be treated uh, in much more depth. So I will skip this part. But just to say that before coming to, to, to an equation, you have to work a lot on some data cleaning, data harmonization, like you do for <laughs> in any other, say, statistical model. Um, and then you have another problem. This is a forecasting model, four week, uh, say, four periods ahead. And your covariates are not, I mean, you have to predict also the covariates that you're using. You have to predict also, I don't know, Google Trends data. You have to predict event data. So it's a very complex model and, of course, it's prone to error. But in fact, in the end, it works quite, uh, quite well. Um, and we apply this to 200 and, and plus countries um, which, uh, with very stable results. So what, just one thing I want to mention is that by using this type of machine learning model, you see clearly um, that there, there's there shouldn't be one model for migration. Like there shouldn't be one model for any other social science, uh, say, <laughs> thing that you want to study. Um, because humans are complex and the dynamics are very complex. So what you see in this plot here is, um, what is called is a heat map, where you have dates. Of course, you, you can see the numbers, but you kind of have to believe me. So you have the weekly results of the model on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis, you have which variables have been selected beginning to end each week. So this is a running model. And what you can see is that there are patterns. So some, for some period of time, some of the variables like here are very important for describing, it's a correlation model, so uh, it's not a causation model. So for describing the, um, Mm, the migration from Syria to Greece in some other part of, of the, so we'll say later on, other variables becomes more important and some of the, these disappears. So what are those red variables I there? Ask you a question yeah. Because I cannot uh, read. Uh, yeah. Is the uh, vertical axis ordered in some way or not? No, the order, the order comes from the color. So yeah. what we do, we do a selection model and then we try to assess uh, the impact of each variable on the prediction. There is a lot of validation, I'm, not, I'm, I'm skipping all of the details, but essentially the reddish are the more important, the bluish are the less important, the white, they are not being selected, essentially. Uh, if I, if I and may it's a relative intervene, rank. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so the, uh, let's say the ordering in the vertical axis is determined by the color. By the color, yes. Yeah, the color scale that determines the, the relative importance. Yeah, yeah thank you. What happens is that, for example, th th that reddish part uh, on the bottom left is actually um, all the event data 
and, uh, and uh, also um, some other statistics coming from Turkey. So this is the, the flow from um, Syrian to Greece, but those people have to go through Turkey. So for, for some period of time, Turkey was very important for them or to explain say, this migration path, and then something else um, um, came in. And same applies for all migration routes. You can see, and then you can explain after with some, say, qualitative modeling, uh, what it is about. And we are applying the same um, now for studying the climate change and migration nexus, which is not clear at all. And it is something you can see with official statistics. So for some reason, there are population that after some climate event, even a repeated climate event, they decide to migrate. But under the same condition, other population, so we are focusing on Africa here, um, those people do not migrate. What, what makes the difference? The only way to, to understand this is to put together, um, say, a multi-dimensional, multi-level model where we put together official statistics, satellite image data, mo mobility data, and other things, and try to understand what create the nexus, which is not um, easy. So we just start this process. Then, for example, the Ukrainian, um, the Ukrainian crisis. So now we know how many Ukrainian people, thanks to Eurostat and the, the National Statistical Institute, are in each country and where they are located in each country. Of course, at the beginning of the crisis, Italians know very well that Italy was one of the targets of these people. But those people were observed by official statistics only at the border between Ukraine and, and Poland, Ukraine and Romania and so forth. So only when they cross the border, because then internal movements in the, in the EU are not tracked. And, but people were coming, and were coming maybe in two or three weeks, because it takes time to move from one parent, from relative to another, uh, finding the money and, and getting to the final destination. But still, Italy or Spain and other countries have to address uh, this humanitarian situation. How do you do this? We try to work with Meta. So in this case, Meta was part of the collaboration. And they, um, and they actually disclosed this report to every European institution. Um, but essentially, we were trying to use um, their data to try to map in continuous time where these people were moving. Okay, because once they left the border, you, you don't see them anymore. So the first thing we do, we did was, okay, is the Facebook um, data somewhat related to diaspora? So we try to, to validate these this statistics for all countries in, in, uh, in Europe. And we come out with, the, um, with an adjusted measure of Facebook data. Because Facebook does not give you the nationality of the people, it just gives you the language. So, and in, and in, in Ukraine, they spoke both, both Ukrainian and Russian. So it's very hard to, to, to just work on the language. But anyway, we were able to, to say, adjust the bias uh, the, uh, that you see from, say, below and, and above plots. And then we, uh, we try to follow uh, how this number in time work compared to the UN and HCR statistics. So where, they are, where, where are these people uh, going? And you will see there is a lag between the Facebook statistics and the UNHCR. So the UNHCR are the dotted lines and the rest is Facebook statistics. For some countries, we don't have UNHCR. But what we see is that there is a systematic lag and this is because the, the Facebook statistics are based on the last month. So it takes at least one month to see these, these stocks, let's say, uh, moving. But anyway, we, you can adjust this. Um, we verify this with the number of temporary protection, uh, say, uh, data, which are official data, which are the, usually the, the, the kind of visa, sorry, the kind of um, permit it's asked by Ukrainian to, to live in a, in a particular country. And you see these numbers were very close. And then the other thing is that you only have this data at national level. So the, the number of Ukrainian, at least um, at that time, it was only available at national level, but the connectivity index was available at NAT3 level. So province level for Italy and other countries. So this is the, um, the diaspora as seen from Facebook. 
and we, we try to actually predict um, where these people were going through this Facebook. And you can actually predict the stock of the diaspora very finely for most of the country that we were interested in. Um, anyway, that's another application. So th there are ways of dealing with the, with the bias, and this is what we, we did. So maybe I will skip, or maybe I'm, oh, five minutes. So let me just skip another topic, which is subjective well-being. Um, sorry. I have zillions of slides, but I will. Uh, so let me go to the conclusion. So where there are challenges, there are also opportunities. So we know about all the limitation of so-called innovative data, which are no longer innovative, but they are just there since like 10 years now. So they are commercial, they, they, they are, the port of data collection is completely different. It was mentioned many times today. Uh, they are collected by, uh, most of the times by devices or say internet applications or or sensors, satellite in, in, in data, for example, while the traditional data, because of the quality, they are collected by trained professionals. Uh, so it's completely different. One is transparent by, even by the law, and, and the other one is not. It's just a commercial thing. I don't want to disclose you anything. I can just give you hints eventually. <laughs> there is no you don't know almost anything about demographic representativity of this data. You have to reverse engineer, and when you don't have a census data or other type of registry, there's nothing you can do. And then, of course, the spatial and temporal completeness may vary. While, for, for example, for at least for Europe, these data are harmonized in time and space. Um, well, you can read the rest. Um, but essentially, cost is one, one other point, and stability or sustainability of using this data is another point for which we need a framework. It, is, it cannot just be data for good. Data for good are there, um, but when, when a company like Meta or the others gives you the data, you don't have the opportunity to ask the next question, like, how did you collect the data? Can you please also collect this? this information, like for the Ukrainian, for example, they don't register the nationality the way we want it, and there was no way to ask for this number, which they do have, but they don't disclose for commercial reason. <clears throat> so, and I want to spend, yeah, I have two minutes, impossible, but um, that's another um, important thing that we did at the European Commission. And I think Fabio will probably, he is a real expert, Fabio Ricciato, who will talk tomorrow. It's about how to use mobile network data. Um, in, in particular, this is not for generating official statistics, but in a, in, a, in a time of crisis, like it was during COVID-19. So during COVID-19, of course, um, Commissioner Breton ask all the mobile network operators, give me the data. And they just give the data because it was Breton, not because it was European Commission, just because he was the former president of GSMA. <clears throat> and so he, he had some, he was an important stakeholder, so he was able to, to get this agreement. But the agreement was, just give me the data and we will try to, do, to deal with it. So we have 17 uh, different mobile network operators over 23 countries plus Norway. Um, the Netherlands never agree because they have some special law that they cannot disclose any of the mobility data. Other countries that were too small, they just w weren't able to, to provide this data. And then we have to deal with privacy concern. So some, some operators send us the data and we have a procedure to, to decide whether we can host this data or not data, like any statistical institute has to do. And in some cases, we receive like the address, uh, not just where these people were located, but everything about these people. So we had to send back the data and say, please, at least remove the identification number or whatever telephone number, aggregate by region and, and so forth. Then there were different types of data. So we, the plot is small, but some 
some mobile operators uh, aggregated data by uh, province, province level, others at regional level, other on a grid, so on a, on a, on a regular grid, say 100 meter per, per 100 meter, other by 1,000 meter per 1,000 meter, and so forth. <clears throat> and they all have different types of uh, granularity in, uh, in time. So we, for Italy, for example, we have three mobile operators, and I will show the numbers, they are completely different. Although the trends are the same, the actual number are different. And none of them will disclose their uh, commercial penetration because it's a sensitive data, they won't disclose. And in this project, everyone was concerned about having the information about the others, so not possible. Of course, you can kind of guess, but it's, this is not enough. And then, so for Italy, we have hourly data and daily data. And we were trying to monitor where people were gathering and, or where the, say, the lockdown, where the enforcement of lockdown was respected or not, because this was related to epidemiological um, models, as you can imagine. And of course, you have different information. If you, if you work at very high frequency in time and space, you don't see whether people move from, say, Rome to Milan, because after one hour, the, the, the statistics is reset. You just see another movement, so you see a movement from A to B, and then a movement from B to C. But it's, you don't know whether it is the same person or not, because you're working too high frequency. And that's, also, also, of course, also a course in space. So we have to, to harmonize different data sources, try to get a sense out of this. And finally, after a few months, um, we were able to come up with something meaningful. And we were able to provide um, some platform, sorry, um, what? Anyway, we were able to provide tools to explore this data, so National Ent Institute could have access to a tool which uses, among other statistics, the, these mobility indicators that we produce to, to simulate the onset of um, the epidemics and how the effect of vaccination uh, can contain these things and so forth. So you can, you can actually create scenarios based on this data. But just let me show you a couple of things. So this is one of the operators. I don't tell you the operator, I don't tell you the country, but it was during 2021. They changed the technology from 4G to 5G. So they were preparing the towers for this new technology. And suddenly the counts changed it. So before the change, it was the blue line. After the change, the green line. So we had to come up with some statistical method to try to realign this time series, otherwise you lose the comparability in time and you don't know whether is this just number of people increasing mobility or what. And you have no notice. So we had to set up a system to actually discover this in real time and then reverse engineer once again the, this to, in order to make, say, harmonized statistics or things like that. So for example, this is Italy, three operators, and, and we were trying to, to understand the mobility between the urban, rural, and, um, and intermediate areas, as per the definition of Eurostat. And you will see the different lines have different values. So the numbers change according to the frequency you get the data, the time resolution, and the space resolution. Same is for Germany. So <laughs> in this case, um, it's even worse, it's completely reversed the who moves mo the most. But this information are the information you have, to, you have to use to feed, for example, epidemiological models. So one discussion we have with Fabio and other people at Eurostat at that point was, how can we use this to generate official statistics? I don't have the answer now, but the one, one answer was, we need to be able to control the way uh, these numbers are produced. Even if, if we don't, we don't want to see your data, we just want to see the statistics, but these statistics should have the quality controls from the very beginning. So we control the algorithm, you implement the algorithm in the hope that you don't change the infrastructure meanwhile. <laughs> then we are again at the same point. Okay, so I'm stopping here. I went too far. So thank you very much. Um, are there questions from the floor? Um, I have something to 
ask you, and but I was so fascinated by the examples you showed us that uh, my ideas were rather on the early uh, points of your exposition. And so uh, I have two stupid questions. Um, you spoke about the laws. So in your opinion, who ought to establish laws? The nations? Yeah, it depends uh, on the framework. Yeah. So here yeah. we are in Europe, so I would expect that the attempt that European Commission were trying yeah. to regulate access to this yeah, data, like it's a good uh, effort. Two to three, something like that, the regulations that are promoted by, the, by Eurostat or the nations. But I, I am asking are, this to you, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, to the scholar, not to the, <laughs> to the, the, to yeah. the, to the mind, to the person. So the, the regulator has to guarantee the access to the data in yeah. a particular form which respects, say, I'm just saying things like GDPR, human rights, whatever. So, and also um, should be able to think about the model who guarantees the, the economic value of this data. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you an example later why this is important. And the statistician mm. should decide how this data should be produced. So both are very important. So Eurostat um, is revising also the, the frame of, of, of official statistics in mm. Europe since mm -hmm. now a long time. Yeah. Mm. At some point I left, so I don't know, but I think it's almost done. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, there are lots of stakeholders involved and it's a long process, so mm -hmm. it might take um, some time, but it's something that, which I think is needed. A statistician should be there. Yeah. May I pose you another question? You spoke, and I understood in which way, about granularity. Um, earlier in my mind, granularity was an intermediate state between the individual data, the microdatum, and the very aggregated data. Uh, so, uh, I thought that uh, the one might conceptualize all the matter with, but it, you didn't speak about this, uh, of something like a hierarchical model where there are different levels of data aggregation, but it's not such what you illustrated as granularity. It is completely different, or it is that I didn't grasp it. No, I think it is. Uh, maybe yeah. I'm just wrong at this point. Yeah, it's very long. So granularity yeah. for me is, act is actually the level of aggregation, but both in time and space. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, when you do this, you have to respect many things, as I said, mm -hmm. from individual rights. Yeah, yeah. No, because um, the, the point is uh, now, given that there are the privately owned data and they do have individual data, maybe not all users claim for individual data. Maybe they ask for differently aggregated data, so with a different level of granularity. So there are, you know, there are some words in the jargon that are not so precisely accepted by so the So in audiences. all these examples, we could not, yeah. because we were at the European Commission, we, could analyze, we couldn't analyze any individual data. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we only work with nice. aggregated data. Nice. But even the level of aggregation was under discussion, yeah. because sometimes we, what we were doing for validation, for example, we took satellite images, we took the MNO data, and the MNO data says there are 2,000 movements in this area, on this period, or 200 movements in this area for this period. You might think this corresponds to the number of people. Not at all. It was just one people, there was just one house, and we knew there was one people. And so, you have to reject this data and ask for proper, say, aggregation of data. Then there are other techniques which were part of the end of my presentation, which is differential privacy. Mm -hmm. So there are ways yeah, to actually guarantee how to disclose data without releasing any information mm -hmm. or without, by releasing some amount of privacy, which you can control by um, some mathematical methods. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions from the audience? Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. I suppose I have a question about sort of the ethics around using alternative data sources. Um, 
I suppose I just noticed that you use social media websites as one of your sources. And is there a chance that maybe social media websites or other companies can justify collecting data under the guise that, well, if you know, if they end up providing it to national institutes, that they're saying, well, we're providing it to NSIs, it's, it's for the public good. We had a case where we had a used car web portal come to us trying to sell us data or provide us the data for free. And kind of what I realized when I had the conversation was that they wanted to give us the data so they could say, we provide data to the Irish Statistical Institute. So, you know, we were basically then standing over statistics that they were producing where that's not what it was. It was they were just providing us data, but we could tell they were going to basically say, we provide data to the CSO, so the data must be good. You can trust what we're, what we're saying. So I was just wondering if you had any sort of comments on that. Yeah, I think I mentioned that the problem that we had this problem with MNO data too. So people sending us data because they were just technicians. They don't care about any legal framework. And so before starting this, it took like four months. So the pandemic was already over and it took four months just to, for us to, to create in the infrastructure to be sure that we, not, we do not leak any information. Uh, we went to our DPO for the, all the privacy concerns. We went to FRA, which is the Agency for Human Rights and European Commission. So this process was very long. Lots of lawyers were, in, were implied. And then we received this data. We look at the data. We have a framework to assess the, all these conditions. And we send back the data. So you cannot just accept the data. You have to control the whole process also for these re ethical reasons, not just for statistical reasons. Yeah. Your talk was very, very <laughs> challenging and, and in interesting. I have uh, two small questions. Uh, the first is sensitivity. If you have made some experiment uh, in which uh, there is uh, some source that, uh, that you, you don't uh, use and uh, your data uh, are still uh, produced, more or less the same numbers. The second is uh, if you somehow or somewhere use some ground truth data, even if uh, some, uh, type, and if they are useful, uh, at least for um, uh, modeling the bias. Thank you. Yeah, the answer is yes. <clears throat> when I say, for example, for the MNO data, but also for the other projects. When you deal with this data, you have to be very robust in what you do in the sense that there might be a situation in which either some data vanishes or some strange numbers gets in because they change the definition of something. And so you have to, to do this quality assessment and you have to, to do also the sensitivity analysis. And you do this in continuous time. I mean, in our case, we did this continuously. So we receive data like every hour and every day we have, say, summary analysis of, of what was going well or wrong. And we get back to the owner of the, of the data and check with them. Um, but yes, that's fundamental. And then the anchoring of the, to, the, to the data, say the, real, the ground truth data, uh, yes. In some cases, you don't have ground truth data. So for example, for internal, move, internal displacement in the EU, you don't have ground truth data. There's nothing you can do, so you can you can work with the diaspora, so with some kind of statistical data, and you try to yeah to validate um, your model on this data. But then, so for example, there is a case which we weren't able to to give a definite answer <clears throat> after the, after the pandemic. Um, the Economist published a paper, uh, an article saying that half a million people from UK uh, migrate back to Romania and Bulgaria. There was no way to assess this, data, this data because LFS was suspended because it was the pandemic and then they were revising the, um, say the weights of the LFS um, labor force survey. And also the labor force surveys, um, 
it's not really representative of migrants. Um, so not the ground truth is also <laughs> questionable sometimes for some very specific application. Um, so what we did, we tried to use mobile data and, and air flight data and see how many people flew and how many people came back, try to use some kind also of network analysis to, to see. And so you can see that there were some difference in balance uh, in both the usage of SIM and the usage of uh, so the number of say, flight in and back to this country during this period. But that's all you can say because you don't have any other, unless you do survey after the fact, there is no other way. So. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, there's a lot of interesting examples, I think, uh, inspiring also. Uh, and I'm sure, actually, many methodologists or statisticians, or uh, if you want, at the statistical offices, actually are intrigued to work on this type of data, too. They are motivated, actually. Um, but on the other hand, I have to say that the, you, you said that a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, papers, but very little statistics in a way, right? And I also have to say that all the examples you give, uh, despite they are successful to their own merits, I, I don't see them as official statistics. I think you agree. So the point is that we are not really getting closer to how to make this to be official statistics using this innovative data, innovative methodology, very fast adaptively to all these situations, right? So I can, I can imagine a situation going forward. Obviously, there is a need to say we want to do this thing, uh, turning out more information, especially like an emergency when there is a war. We want to know what's happening. And we would like to these numbers be pr produced in a reputable sort of scientific manner rather than just any. So but on the other hand, we, I'm, I say, can we keep this apart? I'm happy, actually, to keep this apart. So basically, in a, in a democratic system, can we create a official statistics, sort of this tradition and so on and so forth, but at the same time, we can create some kind, I don't know, data center or whatever, reputable institute with sort of the uh, uh, sort of acknowledged sort of uh, approach and so on and so forth, just keep them, their job separate. They are doing this kind of statistics, but we're not calling them official statistics, but it's still providing a service and an and input a, 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 a sort of a, a what we desired into the democracy, put it this way, uh, rather than just trying to make this part of the business of official statistics. I think that that is going to be a tension that is very difficult to resolve, I think. If, if I may, <clears throat> I don't believe that this division should exist at all uh, in general. I mean, in general, we are all researchers. We just work on different things. Of course, the product must be, must be different, clearly identified, because that's what they are for. But I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't say I don't share the same view of you about the, this division. And when I talk about uh, the, we need a regulation, it's not just about the, the, the National Statistical Institute. It's about this it, another entity. You can call it whatever you want, which might have access in time of crisis about this data, about this, and have to deal with this data. The, the dream is to, to actually have the national statistical offices work with these companies and produce a framework where this data can be produced on a regular basis. You don't want to call it official statistics, I'm fine, I'm totally fine. Use it, use it separately, I don't agree. Both contribute to the to the truth. And for example, I didn't show the part of on epidemiology, but this model and um, this data were able to actually certify that the lockdown were actually able to reduce the number of people dying for, for COVID during the pandemic. And this was scientifically proved, thanks also to the use of this data. The only data we had for, from, from URI is the, the number of excess deaths, which was the only statistics but that there was no way to relate this to how people actually were behaving. And, and this, this is something the official statistics cannot give you. So you have to use them together because you have to implement some policy and you have to implement it now, not in 10 years, maybe. In some other situation, you want to, I don't know, population density estimates. Um, yes, you, can, uh, you, can, you have more time, you need to refine the models and Yeah. 
we, how we, how we kind of manage this in, in a new way, I think. For me, separating is not the way. So working together is the way. Ah, okay. I don't see that. I don't see we will, we will migrate to a stage where these kind of ways of producing statistics, we will just so fast producing and call it official statistics. It won't, right? So mm -hmm. how do we present this one? Who is doing this? Who's, but then you raise a very relevant point is that actually the data access is actually quite important. We want someone who has this legality and, and also trust and so on and so forth. So this means that it cannot be completely sort of decentralized either. It has to be somehow. I agree with that. So it's like the, the framework going forward. Who, how, do we, how do we communicate? How do we sort of disseminate, how do we make people to understand how they treat those informations, basically. Mm -hmm. Just a minor comment. I mean, I think that uh, in terms of migration, there is pretty good stock data in, in, the, in Europe. And, and we could use all of this information to get sort of macro parameters for micro simulations or agent-based modeling. I mean, have you explored their uses in that, in that scenario? Yeah, we, I was in that unit and we work with Eurostat on micro simulation. They do macro simulation. We did micro simulation modeling. Yes, that's another approach, yeah. So there was a question on sensitivity by Piero Falors, but was some sensitivity on the input, uh, on the input data. I, I have like a more epistemological curiosity that looks at the sensitivity on the methodological choice, choices. So you show at least one work where you have a, a huge amount of very dirty data, no, a lot of data, but you get the strength from the vari variety of the data, different time scale. Uh, and uh, I, you didn't have reference data. So the work, if I understood correctly, was more explorative and try to understand pattern. You didn't have a reference through a reference data to compare with, right? And um, you mentioned several times you were skipping data because there is probably a huge amount of methodological choice that you had to do from how you filter each, how you normalize, how you filter, how you clean each and every data points, uh, how you tune the, the parameter of the elastic, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, so it's, it's an immense number of microscopic methodological choice that come uh, together. So let's assume that instead of uh, one Stefano Iacus with one team, we have 12 <laughs> Stefano Iacus with 12 teams of equal, uh, let's say, educational level and background and expertise. And they are given exactly the same um, the same set of data set and the same task. And what, what is your expectation? They will come up with, you know, there was this picture with this matrix uh, with a lot of columns, a lot of colors. Do you expect that this 12 outcome of the same task given to, 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 to comparably skilled uh, teams with the same input data will basically tell the same story, very much the same story with some small variability around basically a nucleus, a core of, of, of findings that is robust, that is there. Or would you rather expect that in some cases they might be telling, let's say, different stories? And if the latter case, if in the latter case, if you put yourself in the shoes of a policymaker that based on this finding has to take some decisions, what would you do? Okay. First of all, we do, I mean, in the case of my, they say the asylum applicants, we do have the ground truth because we have the applications. So these are registered. So in that case, we, we did backtest the model since 2014 on weekly data. So we were kind of confident that, and it's still in use. So maybe it, as an informative, but you're right, this is an informative tool. I do agree. So what I show, and I, I, I think I mentioned during my presentation, this is just correlation. There is no causation going on there. I mean, that you can derive from this model. Then we later applied causal models, not in this example, but in another application, it was about conflict data. And in that case, you really work on, on causal model. So that, that's the next step, which was not part of this presentation and was not part of the work we did for the European Commission. And, and of course, there might be 10 teams, 12 teams during, during the same job with the same input data. They will do lots of fine tuning, say, 
of the parameters of models and choices that you do, and they can come with different numbers. But then you can benchmark on the, on the, on the results, on the actual data. Yeah. So yeah, that's why, why validation is very important. So you always need some kind of ground truth to say something. And if you don't, you just give insights. And that's the only thing, that's the case of the 5,000 people moving from, back from UK to, to the country of origin. The, the conclusion was there is no ground data, ground truth data, any type of data we can use, not, nor in the official statistics, not in the, in the registry. There was no visa, so there was no, no track of these people moving. And secondary movement, movement is still a problem in, in the EU. There is still no way to track secondary movement of European citizens. Even the definition of migrants is a choice. Because now, for example, students, they're not resident in a country for one year and not from January 1st. That's the definition of a migrant. You have to be there the whole last year and you're measured on January 1st. But if I arrive January the 2nd and I stay there for six months and then I move for Erasmus to another country, what I am, I'm not, I'm not appearing in any official statistics. So in that case, you can only guess. You see some movements. There is something, the only thing you have to do, you have to deep drill that situation. And that's the information the policymakers should take action on. Okay, let's see whether there is info, real information or is it just noise. That's the way I will approach if I was, if I were a politician. <laughs> Any further questions? Mm. Okay, please. Uh, I'm totally blind. There are three. Ah, okay. Quality assessment is an essential part of official statistics in a sense that a number can be defined official if it has a measure of accuracy and quality. How far we are from this issue in this context, for instance, concerning the examples of statistics from Facebook, it is not clear to me if accuracy measures were provided or only ex post validation by looking at the number and the phenomena. Did you understand? Yes, okay. <laughs> I, I read the second one. Thank you for the nice presentation. I shared this. I have one question. If statistical data don't influence the decisions on the legal and health pillars, when do you think are such challenges using individual data not to be used alleviated? Should we expect time? Should we wait? I don't know. Uh, what does it? I'm Should not sure I understand that? the question. I, Let me sure. ask first the first question. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, for okay, sure, okay. Yeah. For yeah, sure well, um, official statistics, they do have this quality. Um, I mean, it comes with the definition of an official statistics to have some level of quality, and it's well defined. It's defined even by the law. So it's not just that you decide, okay, the variance of this estimator is uh, 0 0.5, and it's okay. No, it's a complete different process from how you collect the data, how you design the, the, the sampling. So I know all of this, and that's why I put the first slides recognize what is a statistical uh, and official statistics. But that being said, it doesn't mean that, um, it, I mean, it, it depends on who is using the data. So in my case, there's no way I will publish a number without a confidence interval, whether it is a simulated confidence interval, because there is no real data generating process in the statistical sense. Um, so we can use different techniques, of course. But for example, um, for the Facebook advertising platform and also for the other, for Google and Apple statistics, whatever, they do apply uh, different techniques. So for example, they don't disclose data below a thousand number of people. So if you are observing a very rare event, you don't get it through Facebook. But even if, if you have 1,000 and one people, the number can be 2,000 because the threshold is 1,000. So they do a lot of data um, mangling, let's say, which is not the same way a statistician thinks about it. It's a way to protect their, their value. We try to do the reverse. We try to actually understand what's behind. So we try to reverse engineer. That's why we need to validate always this data. There's no way you can use this data just as is. I mean, it, that's my personal opinion. 
Um, but it's hard. I mean, it's hard. And until we have a framework which, uh, which is both methodological, it's legal, and also statistical, I don't see any way <laughs> to, to do more than what has been done so far. I mean, we can do very nice application. I think we did very nice applications. Some of them were very useful, even in the policy context. But it's just, say, the, the drop in the, in the ocean uh, so far. So I totally agree with the comment. Uh, I cannot yeah. just agree. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, we uh, uh, decoded the, the question. In, we were told that maybe, uh, the, maybe the person uh, that uh, uh, posed the question was asking, given that maybe uh, we never arrived at individual data, can the time we have to wait for be shortened? Because indeed, you showed very nice examples, but very much postponed in time, and so maybe not so useful. This is our translation of the question. Okay, if, if this is the, the translation. The, the translation, not the translation, ideal translation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not the translation in the literal sense. So if, it is, if this is the understanding of the question, yeah, yeah, but if just because I don't have my glasses, yeah. so I, I have to trust you. So, <laughs> um, no, the, the point is that with this type of data, you can do, you can do let's say, interpolation. Let me use this, this term. So try to understand what's between two official statistics time point. That's what you do. Or if you think about time, you do now casting. So the example of the Venezuelans coming to Spain, there was no other way. There's just no other way. Even during COVID, there is no way to get, to, to get a survey done. And even LFF was stopped. And they take this opportunity to, to change the framework, the weights. So it's not even comparable from what you had before in the official statistical system. So yeah. it's not that you cannot trust official statistics. Of course, you have to trust because, but you have to understand what it is in official statistics, what is measures. Because, for example, the migrants, for me, it's a definition I learned after one year I was spending there trying to understand what's the difference between a migrant, a refugee, a secondary movement. It's completely a different thing, and you measure, you need different instruments to measure this. Then, most of the statistics, even in Europe, are used as political instruments. So that's why it takes three months to get this number published. I can say now because I'm no longer <laughs> independent, so um, this is the fact. And, and it's even more important at uh, international level. I see. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for your uh, interesting presentation. I want uh, uh, a question about uh, big data quality in terms of predictivity, in terms of comparison among different times. Uh, if we follow um, some uh, phenomena during the time, you can perform your analysis uh, at different times and we know that the different big data sources uh, may change in terms of predictivity also in terms of uh, coverage so every time you have to uh, reperform your analysis uh, um, involving uh, uh, the, the same uh, sources but at least new sources that uh, may vary in terms of uh, usability from uh, users and so on. So a uh, problem uh, could be in uh, also in that in a new time you have to perform a new uh, or this type of analysis, but also in terms of comparison of results uh, of results uh, uh, during the, uh, a long uh, time, uh, a long time of interest. So uh, how uh, a concern is how to get comparability during the time, if uh, there is some uh, comment on this. Yeah, I think I share your, uh, your point of view, and that's part of both the validation and the sensitivity analysis that you have to do, not just once, but continuously, because you don't control the data source. In the official statistics, you do control the data source, so you know when you change something, you know what it means. There, you see something changes or even you don't see because maybe you aggregate it too much. Sometimes, for example, you don't see movements because you aggregate it too much 
in terms of time and space. And you see if people stand still, but they're not. You just don't catch the, the, <laughs> the movement. And so I don't know if it was a real question, but the answer for me is you have to do it continuously because you don't control the process. You control only um, what you get, but not how they're uh, obtained this data. That's why the framework, I mean, it's always the same point. You need to be able to, even for the MNO, oh, sorry. What the movement is, it depends on a zillions of parameters that Fabio can take maybe three hours to explain to you <laughs> why any operator will give you two different numbers anytime at any resolution. <laughs> so, sorry. So, well, the we coffee here. breaks break calls us. So I Thank think so that much. given that the, the presentation of Stefano and the, the one of Fabio are in some sense linked, if we want, if you want, we can go on on the same topic tomorrow morning also. But now coffee. <laughs>